Hey, what's up, everyone? So, welcome, you guys, to Concept to Console. My name is Sergio Elizondo, and this is... I'm sorry, Maru. And this is our journey in publishing video games from literally start to finish, from, you know, you have an idea to it's now in people's hands, you know? Uh, and so... Yeah. So we'll be going through all the different steps as far as what it's like to put out your own indie game. Uh, before we go through those steps, though, we would like to show you a quick trailer of something that we are both working on together. It is a game called Nyanja, about two little ninja cats, and we have prints here for you guys as well. So at the end of the panel, if you guys want to come over here and grab an art print of our new game, you can. But uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and show you guys this trailer. So that was the trailer for our newest project. It's called Nyanja. I am the creator of the game, and Sergio is our composer doing all the music for the game. And uh, yeah, at the end of the panel, we're going to go ahead and give you guys some prints if you want them. And they're here. But uh, yeah, so that's the project that me and him are working on together. We're pretty excited exciting. about it. It's yeah. exciting. Uh, it's pretty much just starting out in development. We've been at it for like a month. Yeah, yeah. So. but a month but into a month, it. Yeah. So. But progress has been good, and uh, we're going to go ahead and talk a little bit more about our other games towards the end of the panel. But before that, we're going to go ahead and get into all the different talking points. Yeah. So I think with regards to, for example, so game concept and ideation. Uh, so one of the games that we're going to see later uh, is a game called Ninja that I had worked on. Um, so before Ninja became Ninja, one thing to keep in mind is that as you're developing or coming up with a concept, it might actually change along the way. And uh, that's actually what happened with Ninja. It originally started as like a, kind of like a, I don't know if you guys are familiar with like a stadium events, kind of like, you know, old school NES kind of game. You're just kind of doing like random events. We were just it, talking and it looked a lot like Ice Climbers a little bit. Kind of, right, yeah, yeah. So initially the, the art style was a little different too. Like it wasn't, they weren't ninjas. It was just kind of a bunch of mini events. But then I started thinking like, well, what's a little more like, I don't know, interesting that people could be like, dude, this is so cool. Like, you know, or I, you feel a little more connected in some kind of way. And so I've always liked ninjas, you know? And so I was like, okay, well, why don't we just make it a game about ninjas that are training to become ninjas? You know, that is gonna be the core concept. So all these like mini events that you go through, it's just you getting one step closer to becoming a ninja. So, and then that's how that kind of evolved and changed from just random events to now it has a theme, now it's got a concept, now it's got, uh, it's gonna take you somewhere. And so that was at least the process for Ninja. Yeah. I mean, you get. So, yeah, you're right. we both have an affinity for ninjas. Yeah. <laughs> Hence why this tell. next game is more ninjas. But um, with my game, originally I made a game called FX and Yuki, which is the girl that's hugging our new little ninja cat character. And when I came up with a concept for that game, it was basically, uh, well, that one it kind of wrote itself because I already had a webcomic made for it, and then it went from webcomic to video game. So it, the, the concept was pretty much already laid out for our game. But uh, going forward with this game, uh, it was basically just that we both liked ninjas and we wanted to make a game that was about ninjas. Yeah, like cats too. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. All right. Design aesthetic. You want to take that one? All right. So, as far as designing your game, you pretty much have to work with what you're comfortable with, right? So, like, say you're you're putting together a game, and you're if you are not the artist, but you have an idea, it's about relaying that idea to whoever you're is doing your your game design, right? It, as far as aesthetics goes, it also it's what you're comfortable with as far as what you want your game to revolve around, mm -hmm. you know? So, yeah. like, what do you think? I think for me, the design and aesthetic, as I was just mentioning earlier with how Ninja, and it just, again, it didn't really have a theme. There was just kind of random events, but once that Ninja theme was applied to it, 
more ideas started rolling one after the other. Oh, let's make him look like this. Oh, let's make him two different colors. Oh, cool. Now the two player effect can, can now do this. And now oh, let's add a point system. So that way, you know, which ninja is doing better. And so I just feel like once the design was solidly in place, at least for that particular project, it really helped it propel uh, into, um, you know, just to, to, what, to what it became. Uh, but I do think design and aesthetics, again, do play an integral role in, in making your game feel like what, what you want it to feel. Yes? Could uh, whether or not you have, like, 3D or 2D, the change of design and aesthetics? Oh, yeah, certainly. Oh yeah. Yeah. No. I don't know. If we, it, neither one of us has any real experience with 3D. No, <laughs> mine's been 2D. We're, we're both very 2D based sprite. Pixel. Yeah, yeah, pixel sprite based. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it could definitely affect it. It really depends too if um, if you have someone who's already working on 3D models for you or anything like that. It might even be faster to go through with creating a game in 3D. It, it really just all depends. Like sp sprite based work takes time, but it also depends on how much time you're willing to put into it. But yes, it definitely takes, it It does affect it, yeah. Yeah, sure. imagine collision would be totally different too. Oh yeah. It'd be yeah. crazy. Yeah. yeah. But that's something we have very little experience with, unfortunately. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to 2D games, yeah. Yeah, we it's a little more, there, yeah. It's, and I think that's a great point. I think for, with regards to scope of the work, with the type of game you're going to be making, I think it's, you got to take into consideration the limitations of what you're working with. You know, mine in particular, again, is Ninjas, 2D based. Uh, collision and things of that sort were a lot easier to manage. You know, there's only so many points that, you know, uh, your character can interact with something or be hit by something mm -hmm. or in that particular regard. And so I think when you're starting to make your own first game, really take that into account because that's going to really, really change the scope of work that you're going to be dealing with later, yeah. significantly. That actually brings me back to the platform because we actually released our games for old platforms. He, his game originally released for the NES mm -hmm. and mine released for the TurboGrafx-16. So these are, these are legacy consoles. So that's also going to play a big picture, right? Um, yeah. As far as limitations go. You're limited, especially with the NES, you're limited to a lot yeah. more, you know, when it comes in terms of design, you can't go crazy because you have, what, three colors to work with? Yeah. Per sprite, um, on the TurboGrafx-16, you have 15 colors to work with per sprite and one, one background color. Mm -hmm. So that really limits what you can do. So if you're choosing to make a game for the first time, I might not recommend doing it for a legacy platform only because you're going to lead into so many limitations. Um, there are other things out there like Game Maker, um, Unity. If if GB you have the time, GB Studio is a good GB one. GB Studio. Oh, that's so here. Yeah, that's a legacy. Yeah. It's for a legacy console, right? It's for for the Game Boy, old school Game Boy. But the GB Studio in itself is such a powerful tool for mm -hmm. creating uh, levels and creating uh, different types of mechanics. It handles collision. It handles a lot of things that would normally require a lot of like know how up front as a programmer. Don't even worry about it. You can focus more on the game and how it needs to feel. Right. Um, and yeah. so you could you could still write for legacy consoles, but here's the other thing too, which we'd be going to later. But Ninja, for example, is going to be on Nintendo Switch, right? So it's also being converted to that it could be played on modern consoles. So if you decide to release a game on a uh, legacy console, there's uh, there's so many different ways that you can still get it published on you know the PlayStation or PlayStation Network, you know. Right. And we'll get to that actually. Yeah. That's actually one of our talking points is um, finding a third party publisher as well. Um, yeah. Or you can go the route of trying to publish it yourself as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, we'll get to that. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm jumping we, ahead. We have that, that talking point. But I did want to mention how we had originally made our games for legacy, legacy consoles, but it might not be the, the easiest thing. Yes? Do you, have you, have you had experience um, in gaming companies before you started making the games? I didn't know. I didn't. I had none. I always wanted to make a game, um, and when I went to planning our game, FX and Yuki, uh, I pretty much knew the type of game that I wanted to make. But uh, prior to this, uh, I've never made a game before. FX and Yuki, which is this game here, is, was my first game. This is the PC Engine version, and then we ported it to the Sega Dreamcast with with help. So yeah, you don't need to have had prior experience per se. I mean, you, you learn a lot of things along the way. But yeah, it does require a lot of research. Though. It does. A lot yes. of trial and error. Yes, yes. Too. Yes. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I have a question as well. Uh, there, it's a very nerdy question and technical, but <laughs> I can imagine that using external hardware such as cartridges, uh, discs, and stuff versus a digital download of the game can also really affect development. 
uh, and this is a very nerdy question, but there are certain PS3 games that come to mind that do not work properly if you don't use the proper version of the game, whether it's PSN package or disc. Has that affected you in any way? Mm -hmm. I think for me, like when I've released Ninja, I've, I've released the ROM per se. So most emulators can handle it. The type of uh, mapper that it is is what we call an NROM. It's one of the most basic mappers for the NES. And so that can be handled by almost any emulator out there. So in that particular regard, no, it hasn't hindered, but it could have been an issue because I have seen uh, where friends of mine have released some of their games, uh, but the mapper that they've chosen to use only works with like specific emulators nicely. And others, the graphics break. Certain layers shoot forward that shouldn't shoot forward. Collision kind of gets messed up. And so, in that regard, it, it could play. I've run into that before with trying to emulate Twilight Princess on a dolphin. There you go. That's, Everything with the metal. Yeah, case in point. So, it just really depends, you know, on, on the, the, how the game was formatted when it was extracted, per se, and then, you know, what you're using to emulate to run it. Uh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Radical Reggie and the media glitch just. Hey, they brought us, hey, what's happening? They brought us lunch. Oh, you guys are so guys. Thank you. Thank Thank you. We're ready to sex. Oh, my. Oh, my. Oh, and we have Smash. I just looked over for Smash JT. What's up, Smash? How are you doing? All right, we'll, yeah, we'll talk. We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> All, right. All the cool people in here. Thanks for showing up, guys. <laughs> we wouldn't miss it. We love both of you guys. So. I love you more because I was here before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't love you more than my mom. I actually love you more because I stay in your house. That's true. Oh, oh, All right, this is taking a twist. <laughs> <laughs> that escalated quickly. Yeah. All right, so sound and music and creation. So I'll, I'll take this one. So uh, I do have a background as a musician. You know, um, I'm not just throwing notes at a board and seeing what sticks and what's gonna work right for a game. Um, I was, uh, so I went to school for music, actually, I'm a music major, um, but prior to becoming a music major, I was already playing in punk rock bands and writing music, writing chord progressions, writing melodies. I've already had, I've always had ideas before even getting into, uh, getting into some of the know-how for music theory. When it comes to, I think, video game music, I think for me, their aesthetic plays such an important role. Um, and half the time when I write music for someone's game, uh, I always ask, what do you want it to sound like? Give me some examples. Because if you leave it to me, I'll make it sound the way it looks to me. You know, and it, 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 I think for the most part, I think it sounds pretty awesome when it's left to me. But I also like to make sure that I'm within the scope of uh, the person's vision, the person's dream, you know, what they want to see come to life. Uh, and so in this particular case, Nyanja, um, when Sarah and I were talking about it, we're like, all right, so what should it sound like? And we're like, okay, we're gonna give it like a Japanese vibe, you know, maybe some traditional instruments, but uh, I, I, need, I need some more examples. Like, can you give me something? And so he shoots over a game on the Super Nintendo. And I, I played that soundtrack, I don't know, like maybe like a couple of weeks, just, not, not, just on replay, from start to finish, from tracks that sounded Japanese, that did not, to like boss themes, to whatever, all of it, only because I knew Saru liked it. And so my job now as a musician was to, to capture that essence, not taking anything from it, but just capture the essence and, and turn it into what you guys just heard in the opening uh, trailer there. Um, and the, the inspiration for that was actually the Legend of the Mystical Ninja for the Super Nintendo. Mm -hmm. So if you guys heard hints of that, then yeah. that was the inspiration. And so as, as a composer, what I'm looking at when I'm listening to these portions, uh, these pieces of the music, I listen to the chord progression, I listen to the melody, I listen to the harmonic structure, like how it's all, you know, struck up. Because, I mean, again, if you're born for like a Japanese vibe, they're going to have a very particular chord progression. There's going to be a particular scale that they're using. There's going to be a, just a particular, it's just going to be very unique to Western music. It's yeah. not going to be at all the same. Very specific sounds. Yeah. Flutes. Yep. Yeah. Maybe the drum beat, the, tr the, the overall rhythm section will have, could have like a Westernized kind of feel, but the, 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 the layer on top, what we're hearing melodically, that's what's going to have the most impact on us. And so, yes. Are you using a... Are you using actual instruments or are you using computerized Good question. Both. So depending on the scope of the project, uh, like for example, um, the immortal John Hancock, his game Blockham and Sockham, that was for the Super Nintendo. I did his Genesis as well, and the NES version as well. Those were all using what we call trackers, so anywhere from open MPT, uh, MTP uh, for Super Nintendo, Family Tracker for the NES, Defle Mask for Sega Genesis, like so it just depends on, on the scope of the work. 
In this particular case, these are real instruments. So the drumming that you heard earlier, uh, the playing, it was playing on a keyboard, but then you know it's, it's uh, synthesized, so I can make it sound like whatever instrument I want it to sound like. Right. Because uh, we're working with CD, so it's. I can it's record real stuff. Easy to just use real instruments. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on the scope of the work. Uh, I don't. If I had a preference, I don't really have a preference. I think both of them have their limitations, and both of them have that. Um, they kind of push me to 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 check my harmonic structure in, in a different way, depending on. Um, yeah, again, like what it's going to be. So I like both. I think both are, are fun to write in. Um, but yeah. All right. So I guess now we can talk about how we go about with creating like a story, game mechanics. Mm -hmm. It's pretty much like the basis, right? Yeah, like, I would say so. Of the game. So with our game, Epic Student Yuki, because I was creating this game for the first time, I didn't really have a scope for it. And I was like, oh, I want you know, things to explode, and I want this, and I want that. I need to shoot them up stages, and I started just throwing a bunch of ideas. And then when the game started coming to fruition, I was like, okay, there is too much going on. I probably should have narrowed down the scope of the game. But in the end, it turned out okay, but it was, it was very stressful. I think that uh, next time around, with this new game that we're making, we've pretty much closed like the scope of the game. It's not as complicated as I fixed in a UV was with various different stage types, but I do think that having a idea of what your mechanics are going to be like, you have to tell yourself, are you going to create a shoot-em-up stage? Are you going to create an action platformer stage? What are your stages going to look like? Mm -hmm. uh, now, as far as like your story and world building, that's really, that's really up to whatever your idea is and how you go about building it. What, what do you think? Yeah, I think for me, uh, well, for example, I think going back to Ninja, uh, it was just meant to be a party game. It's meant for you to jump in, do a few events, and then, you know, uh, or challenge a friend and see who does better, but mash it, you know. And so the narrative for that one uh, wasn't quite in place uh, until, again, it changed to being a ninja theme. And then it kind of had a small narrative. Now, again, you're a ninja in training, and that that's the whole point of the game is that you want to become a full fledged ninja. Um, but in some of the other projects that I've seen, I, I feel like the narrative, well, it's, it's kind of tough to say. I don't know, sorry. Like, you, I think you would have a little more, especially for Ninja, like, what inspired you to, to create that environment? Well, I mean, we both like Ninjas. We both I like guess that's true. I think that, that, that pretty much wrote itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, as far as story building for it, it was, I kind of just went along with, all right, this is how I want the basis of the story to be. I want it to be two Ninja Cats. And then, like, little by little, I'm like, okay, we're going to have, like, this kind of villain in the game. This is the kind of mechanic that the game is going to use. Uh, we decided to go with like a Snow Bros Bubble Bobble type of game with this one because like I said I wanted to like mm, narrow the scope of like the game mechanics compared to our other game of Student Yuki which we'll show you a trailer at the end of that game as well. Um, but I feel like we did that with Nyanja. We scaled it down and focused more on the fun aspect yeah. of it and the world building just kind of fell naturally mm. with it. You know just different Japanese type of things and themes. I agree, yeah. I think with regards, for example, to mechanics, um, a lot of that, I think for me, it was, um, I want to say, I worked off of the limitations for the NES in particular, and again, the type of mapper that we were working with, a lot of that was, it felt a little, um, I'm not going to say basic, it, it was pretty complicated, but in the sense of like, you know, that was that was a scope that we, we had this like, you know, you, we can only move in so many different directions. Okay, so that's a limitation that we have. How can we build something out of this where we can only move like this uh, into something fun? Um, and I, I think for each particular event, uh, that was part of like the, the planning process was to see how each event could be fun or entertaining and not just be like a rehash of the previous event, you know, because it's, it's using similar mechanics due to limitations. Um, and so I think understanding your environment and the scope of work will also help determine what kind of mechanics you're going to be able to have within the game itself. Right. So. Yeah, pretty much you're, you have to understand what your limitations are for whatever it is that you're, that you're creating your game for. Mm -hmm. But nowadays there's so many different things that you can use to create games. There's like Godot Engine, there's Unreal Engine, yeah. there's Game Maker 2. Mm -hmm. So the, lots of newer games are made with these engines, right? Like the Messenger, I believe, was a Game Maker 2 game. Right. I think, was it, again, going back to GB Studio, I think that one, for example, you can have like the RPG kind of approach, you know, like the 
the Pokemon red, blue, you know, yellow Zelda, kind of overhead, overhead kind of game. Overhead yeah. shot, red. You know, and then you go into a battle and it changes into text based, you know, and then you exit and you're back into this overworld view, like that kind of stuff is built in. So that in itself, that's that's a nice scope. Like that's that's some great mechanics that you can work with. Right. Uh, and really build some stuff on. But um, then you also have the limitations of working with a game on the Game Boy, and that's a whole different story. Yeah, the compatibility issues you might run into, as yeah, we talked earlier. Back to, yeah, yeah, what he said. Yeah, that's definitely something that you're going to run into with Game Boy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> do, you, do you have a preference on what type of console is your favorite to work on for a game? That's a great question. I, I know you, know, you, you already know the answer to this, but thank you for asking that question. So for me, I'm a huge PC Engine TurboGrafx-16 fan, so that's always been my preference. Uh, my, my first game, FX Unit Yuki, and this game, Yanjar, both for TurboGrafx-16. It's just a console that I grew up with, and for me it was just one of those consoles that is near and dear to my heart. So that's, for me, that's why I chose to do my games for the TurboGrafx-16. But even as you've grown and learned about other ones, <coughs> you still have to loving I do, though I'm more open now to trying to create games for other things, like um, I'm also uh, working on a Genesis game. Even though we did port our game to the Sega Genesis, like the physical Sega Genesis cartridge, uh, one of the other game projects that I'm working with another programmer is on the Sega Genesis, and little by little, I'm starting to find an affinity for putting stuff out on the Sega Genesis. Even though I was not, I was not a huge Sega fan back in the day, but now I'm starting to, starting to warm up to it, to putting games out on I mean, didn't you also have it on Dreamcast? Yeah, yeah right here. But that was just because people wanted it. Okay. Not, not particularly because I wanted to make mm -hmm. it on the same Dreamcast. It was just we had done a Kickstarter, which uh, we'll actually get into that point next. Reggie. Are you liking the soundtrack on the Genesis version? I do, actually. That's you another thing, too, is that the Yamaha sound, right, has like this like crisp chip tune. Yep. When done right, obviously, you know, you have people like Sergio who know also how to do it, but. I, I'm, I'm liking the, the soundtrack on our Genesis version of FX Unit Yuki. I think chiptunes just hit different. Yeah. They do. They do. Yes. I wonder, why do you, uh, why do you more to older consoles instead of newer consoles or PCs? Mm, I think because, in my case, I'm old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> these are the consoles that I grew up with. I had a, I had a 2600 and you know, I, I, I had a, a Nintendo and then the TurboGrafx-16 Super. And these are just consoles that I've always wanted to, when I was a kid, I've always wanted to make a game for these consoles. And now that I'm an adult and the resources are there to be able to run into other talent who also has uh, appreciation for these older consoles, I think that's why I decided I wanted to do stuff for older consoles, but we do port stuff to newer to the newer consoles. But it's basically the same older game. Joe, how old are you? Because if you're old, I'm Asian. Let's in. No comments. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll talk after. Late late seventies. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Late seventies. Late seventies. Okay. Yes. Uh, do you have a specific? Uh, focus that you like to start with when creating a game? Like you start with story or mechanics or anything like that? Mm, that's a good question. For me, I revolve everything around a character. Like I'll make one character and be like, this character is freaking cool, but what do I want him to do? And I just start building around this character. Uh, for instance, this game, uh, Nyanja, it's this cat character here. I actually created him back in 2004. And uh, I would upload stuff to DeviantArt of like mock-up game screens of how I imagined this character would play in that game. And uh, I always told myself, someday when I have the resources, I'm going to make a game with this little cat character. And then here we are. And I basically just focus everything around just this one character and what his world would be. But what about for you? Yeah, I was just going to say, I, th I think for me it was the opposite. It just started off with mechanics. It was literally like, OK, these are the limitations. Let's make something fun. Okay, it's going to be event based. Okay, and then and then from that point it kind of morphed into something different. But it was just mechanic driven in that particular case. I mean, some of the other projects that I've worked on, a lot of them have been either music based, like audio on the NES, or video and audio on the NES. Not really, you know, uh, gameplay based. Um, but yeah, again, other projects that I've written for. Um, 
to me, it seems like the story's in first. Mm -hmm. You know, they're writing things out. I'm seeing screenshots of the game. I'm seeing dialogue of the game, like as I'm in these Discord channels, uh, watching it come to life. And then as I see a good screen, I go, oh, cool, I can write to this. Because I haven't been given direction, right? They're like, just make me some music. All right, I'll make you some music. But I need to see what the game looks like, so I don't just blindly write you something, because then it's going to sound like Mega Man when you're playing, I don't know, just like something that's not Mega Man based, you know? Something more chill. Like, something that's like a farming game. <laughs> like a farming game. <laughs> Heavy metal guitars. <laughs> you're like, dude, what the? It's not, it's not going to fit, you know? And so just taking that into consideration, like, yeah. So I, I think, I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah. But well, yeah. I think for me also, because I'm an artist, I draw out everything. Like, I do the pixels, I do the, all the, all the material for my games, I, I do the illustrations for. And because I'm an artist, I'm always doodling stuff. And so sometimes I'll doodle something and be like, hey, that character looks cool. And going back to the point of revolving everything around a single character. And I think that's what it is for me, because I'm an artist and I like to draw. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll draw on a napkin and be like, all right, this is going to be the game idea right here. Mm -hmm. and that's, that's pretty much it. Joel. Was there some in FX Unit Yuki that um, you wanted to put in the game, but for space or for time you just weren't able to? Oh, yes, yes. That you uh, love and you were like, oh man, I wish I would have been able to do that. Stages. Uh, so on the PC Engine, you have so much room for like VRAM to like put stuff in. And so like when I started doing the plans for the game, I just my levels were like enormous. And then when it came down to it, we could only put so many screens into the game, so whole levels or whole sections from our stages pretty much had to be cut out. Bosses had to be completely cut out. And thankfully, because we were doing a Steam version, we were able to bring all that stuff back that we cut out, so that's kind of more of an incentive to get the Steam version when that's out, is we're able to bring all the stuff that we cut out of it, but yes, we, there was a bunch of stuff we, we had to cut out, unfortunately, due to space. And, that's another thing. Talk going back to the, the legacy stuff yeah. is that you have to you have to consider how much space you're working with too. Mm -hmm. But that's something to keep in, in mind. I think he made he made a good point there. I think ultimately is when you do release a, a game on a legacy console, something to keep in mind is that if you're going to release it later on the PlayStation Network or you know Nintendo the, the eShop online. You could do just that. You could yeah, add those extra stuff. levels that you couldn't have had before. I ran into that same thing with Ninja because when playing the game, I always say to everyone, read the manual because every event is different with different mechanics. It's not all, they're not all the most intuitive, which if I, if I could go back in time, I would have added some more screenshots mm, of like yeah. little, and but you know, all this feedback came after the game was released, after the Kickstarter was done, and then they're like, I would, how do I do this event? I'm like, read the manual. Right, and then read it's like, book. your game's already done. It's, it's done, done. It's done. Oh. Yeah. and so it's kind of tough to fix, right? And that's what's kind of happening, yeah. right? And so as it's being released, released on Nintendo Switch, we now have, thanks to Star, we have this beautiful uh, vanity, like, you know, uh, overlay. But on top of that, we have buttons now. And it's showing you what each event needs to do. Is it a left-right trigger? Is it an A-B? Or is it right-B, right-B, right-B? Like, what's actually happening? What, you're, what are you supposed to be doing? And so in that particular regard, uh, that's one way you can uh, start off with the legacy console, the legacy game, and then when it moves on to modern platforming, you can add more things to it. So that's another. Yeah, I think so that's important. A big advantage mm -hmm. of being able to port your game to stuff later on in time. Yeah. Oh, this. When do you want to start doing pre-orders for the new game? For the new game? Yeah. Um, we're gonna first put out a demo, and once the demo's out, we're thinking about doing a Kickstarter. For the game, so actually, thank you for asking that question because that's pretty much our next segue. Yeah, is uh, talking about how to get the funding for your game. So, there's yeah. I might get started a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think when it when it comes to crowdfunding, um, marketing, marketing, marketing is so important before you even start the Kickstarter. You need to have already built, you know, at least a small following at the bare minimum, like a few hundred followers. Like you have to have a Your following. Facebook page, or yes, Discord, or yes. whatever. Yes, yes. And you have to be posting like all the time about the game and just again building, building hype around it. Tell your friends who have bigger followings, be like, hey man, you want to give me a shout out? I'll hook you up with a copy of the game, kind of thing. Do what you got to do, but 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 spread the word as much as you can long before the crowdfunding even occurs. Yeah, be ready to give your game to like anyone who will talk about it. So yeah, you're gonna have if somebody copies. has a platform and they're willing to talk about your game. Yeah. 
send, send them a cable. A lot of money up front. Yeah. You know, because you're going to be giving away copies. But, but you're not just giving it away. Right. Yeah. Right. In the end, it's, it's, it's beneficial to you. That yes, marketing it's going to cost prices. you the money. Yeah. But the marketing that they give you. <laughs> I got you, bro. I'll get you. <laughs> yeah. How long you too. What's that? How long have you been out? 2017. Dude, I'm, I'm sorry, dude, I'm sorry. We're the bottom of the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> you want it wrong or do you want the, 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 the card? What do you want? Yeah, I got you. Um, but no, I think it's super important to keep that in mind again, because once crowdfunding, once it's going and that campaign's running, you got 30 days to make this happen. You know, you got 30 days. And Ninja, for me, was funded in like seven hours. Wow. The first seven hours or like something like that. Yeah, it was immediately funded. But part of it is a strategy of how you set up your Kickstarter. What kind of tiers do you have? What do you, um, do you have like some nice expensive tiers where people can have their name in your manual? Uh, they get a special cart. They get something kind of unique that would otherwise is not going to be outside of the Kickstarting campaign, right? So you want to create these special tiers that cost a little more, which are going to also help boost uh, you reaching that, that funding goal. So yeah. So with FX and Yuki, we did the same thing. We had different tiers. Um, and then for those of you who don't know, Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a crowdfunding ha campaign that people use to give you money so that you can bring your stuff to fruition. With our game, FX and Yuki, we had basically different tiers where we would do like just the game, and then we'd do like the game and like a sticker thing or whatever. But it was important to just have different tiers. Uh, what you know? I don't know. It's, it's, it's a personal to ask you how much you guys asked for your oh. for your project because that's another thing we're going to get into. Yeah. the cost of stuff. No, 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 that's not at all personal. Um, I think the initial one, the and the, what was marketed or sorry, what was planned out was the the overall production of like we need at least fifty units to reach. You know. To, to make it feasible or to make it like reasonable to produce this, uh, and I think ours was at like two, like three thousand. It was super low. It wasn't it wasn't high at all. Was that for uh, physical carts? I mean, for physical carts, oh, yeah. Wow. And so and so physical carts are expensive, right? Yeah. The board alone that goes inside of the NES can cost you anywhere from I don't know eight to ten bucks a pop, depending on what you're using, wow. to more expensive ones that are like fourteen dollars a piece, fifteen dollars a piece. Right, that's just the, the the guts, right? The inside. We're not even talking about shells, shells, yet. or stickers, yeah. or there's like five bucks a piece. Yeah, the cases, stickers, about a buck a piece, depending on how many you're making. Yeah, uh, I yeah. Of your stickers. You, I paid a lot more than that. Oh, dude, I'll, yeah. I'll share the the, the deets. <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, what's up? I was gonna say, have the friends that are in those industries like um, doing the stickers or doing like screen printing or stuff like that. Oh, that, yeah. that helps a lot. And, and that's exactly what happened, yes. And so for my manuals, the boxes, uh, I had a, a friend do that for me. I mean, I still paid him, but like it, was at a, at a, it wasn't at the premium. It was at a less of a cost, right? Uh, but I also hooked him up with a few copies of the game, too. So in that regard, it was kind of a trade. Um, but yeah, that's yeah. another thing, too, is trade for work, too. If you can like find people... To, to trade for work. Like with my game, I had a programmer, his name is Old Rover, the programmer for Epic Student Yuki. He did my programming and I did his artwork for a different game. So I did artwork and assets and pixels for him. He did programming and assembly for my game. So we do that for each other actually all the time. Yep, yeah, we do that. He does music for me, I do art for him. Not charging him, he's not charging me, but every time we need each other, hey, Serge, get me on. I yeah. need some music, dude. Yeah, when do you need it? Two weeks? Okay, I'll get you in two weeks. Like. You know, or, and then again, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, how do you guys uh, find like quality teammates? Because the like, for example, I've been working on for a game for 17 years now. Uh, wow, a long time ago. Um, and like my like the hardest thing is like, especially like for animators and stuff like that. I'll have them for a year and then they're gone. So then the next guy's like, mm, I don't like his style. So then he wants to redo all the work. And then, he and then like, I have a coder who's like, ah, I don't like the way the guy that did this. And he'll, like, delete everything and redo it. So, like, you know, when you're having a lot of turnover, how do you guys... I, I think for me, I think it's, it's more of, like, I'm just personal with people. You know, I just build a friendship around uh, things that we like. And uh, I think for, for me, the partnerships that I've had with other developers or, or other talent, it, it's just we're, we're friends. You know, we become we become homies, so to speak. You know, and so um, there. Whenever I need to talk to Saru, it's like it's, it's just a friend now too. But we're, we're also business partners at the same time, and we're working on something together. Right. So, 
So for me, um, with FX and Yuki, it was a TurboGrafx-16 game. I was someone who was on the TurboGrafx-16 forum since 2008, so I got to know a lot of people who were uh, enthusiasts of the TurboGrafx-16 as well, which included a programmer, it included a tile artist, um, and my composer for FX and Yuki, who is somebody else, was a composer that I worked with on an old like PC game called Osu. It's a music game. I was the uh, character designer. I, I made like the mascot for that game, and I met him through that project. And I was like, I loved his music. And I was like, I don't know when, but one day I'm going to make a game, and I want to hire you. And he was like, oh, okay, whatever, you know. And eventually, like that did happen, and I got to hire him to do the music. So it really just. Could just be circumstance too. It could just be like you know you're part of a forum and then you start talking to these people for years and then they're like yeah let's do this thing. I think forums is an important key. Yes. Oh, this is a funny story. I was gonna ask DJ. You remember that that that, that run we tried to have, we had tried to work at the same UK the Dreamcast. The Dreamcast. That was yeah. like so crazy. Yeah. yeah. So right up with Reggie over here, he actually helped me with the porting of the Dreamcast game because like Dreamcast you have to use like this old ass. Sorry, this old uh, program <laughs> called Disc Juggler to like work yeah, games. Disc Juggler. And it's like, yeah, it not only works yeah. on like Windows <laughs> XP machines. So and I'm like, I'm old, but like, I don't have a computer this old. Like, um, you know, I've got like iPads and stuff in the house. And I was like, Reggie, do you know, can you do this for me? And he's like, oh, yeah. And then you ran into trouble too, right? Yeah, like, he the, burned after like. After it finished, that the CD went, the CD burner went out. So I was like, wow, I love you. But yeah, that so great. that's another thing working with legacy hardware is like trying to get the stuff out physically yeah. working before you actually go into release. And Reggie, I don't know how many CDs, how many CDs did you burn trying to help me with that? Yeah, it's like 10 CDs, I think, right? Yeah. And it would just crap out. And aren't those no. GD-ROM too, right? It's not just like DVD or... Oh, no, they're, they're CDs. So they're CDs. Dreamcast yeah. had two different types. They had GD-ROM. GD -ROM, yeah. And then they had something called Mill CD. And Mill um. CD is basically just like a regular CDR. Gotcha. And that's how they used to crack the Dreamcast. Is the Mill right. CD was pretty much what, what tanked the Dreamcast. Oh, man. You know, but at the same time, it's also what, what brought such a huge... Uh, third party market or aftermarket because after the Dreamcast was dead, people were releasing games like we did for the Dreamcast long after the death of, Dream of the Dreamcast, thanks yeah. to the fact that it had this exploit. So, mm -hmm. thanks to this exploit, a lot of people got to release their games physically yeah. on the Dreamcast and started their whole careers from that. And then they started porting those Dreamcast games that they made because they were able to use the exploit of the Dreamcast to further their their careers, and then those games came out on Nintendo Switch and Xbox and what have you, mm -hmm. all because of an exploit that we also took advantage of. Yes. Yeah. Uh, someone who probably doesn't know much about Dreamcast, what, what exploit are you talking about? So the Mill CD is basically the, there's, a, the Dreamcast uses GD-ROMs, which is like a, like a copyright protected CD. Well, Mill CD was what Sega used to make, like, random BS software like photo CDs and stuff like that and, and hackers found a way to use that to put games using that same exact format that would allow them to boot up. But that same exploit also helped people make pirated games. Like That's why people were able to self-boot games using regular CD-ROMs versus GD-ROMs because of the fact that this exploit exists. But because that very same exploit that people were using to pirate games exists, also cultivated a huge market, aftermarket, for the Dreamcast with that same exploit. Wasn't it like only certain Dreamcasts do it though, or is it every Dreamcast? Almost all of them, except the very last run of Dreamcast that came out, I think, in 2001. So we actually have run into that problem with some customers like, hey, your crap doesn't work on my Dreamcast. And we, we're like, we're sorry, you might have a Dreamcast that isn't compatible. It's super rare though. That apparently it was their very last batch of Dreamcatcher, Dreamcatch, Dreamcasts before they went completely defunct. So thankfully, I want to say maybe 90% of all Dreamcasts out there will play Mill CD. Without doing anything. Without doing, yeah. You just pop them in. Like John Riggs, his game also is a Dreamcast game that uses the same exploit that we do uh, to, play, to play his game. Yeah.
So I may be misremembering this at all, but uh, was uh, the Dreamcast tough to make games for? Because uh, I think I remember hearing that the boot up logo screen took up a lot of the storage on the CD. It wasn't on the actual Dreamcast console itself. Was it on the CD, or am I misremembering that at all? The boot up, uh, the boot up is is on the console. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess follow up with uh, what would be your uh, hardest console to make for then? Older or newer consoles? Ooh. Like, it depends. Pretty much anything that has strict copyright protection. So, mm -hmm. say like PS, even PS One would be hard because PS One games you still need some sort of modification to play a PS One game, game, even mod chip or something like that. Yeah. PS Two homebrew is pretty much non-existent. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of and pretty much anything with copyright protection, which is the same reason why we don't see a whole lot of Sega Saturn uh, home homebrew. There's like. Not, it's non-existent as well. There's maybe a couple people who were, you know, wanted to really tinker with it, but there isn't a whole lot of Sega Saturn homebrew because of the fact that copyright protection keeps them from doing it. Yeah, and then part of like making your game too is like maybe you do choose uh, choose a niche market. You know, maybe you do want it to be NES or you want it to be Super Nintendo. Um, I mean, heck, it could still be Sega Saturn. It just runs on emulators. You just don't make hard. Uh, you don't make physical copies. Yeah, and no one will buy it. And, <laughs> yeah. So then it's not good marketing, right? Yeah. So then you, it just depends on what you want to do. Yeah. But if, if, if you want to create a nice product, I would, I would go for something that doesn't deal with any kind of copyright or uh, some kind of blocking. Yeah. Of NES, Game Boy. Mm -hmm. um, there's lots Amiga. to choose from. A lot of Amiga, consoles. Amiga? Amiga? Um, yeah. yeah. That's a obscure system. Yeah, I think. Mm -hmm. You have one, right? Don't you have one? Yeah. Do, do you have the US one? Huh? Which one do you have? Because I heard they're super, super rare. I mean, yeah, I had the one that wasn't released um, during that whole cycle. The US so one. I saw yeah. like home games still being made for that system, which I thought was Really? Yeah, that's true. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Something to also yeah. keep in mind, sorry guys. <laughs> Something to also keep in mind with, with crowdfunding too um, is you can run into uh, holdups in your production. So it's something to, to, I mean, I'm currently experiencing a holdup on, so on one of the projects I've worked on most recently was NES and digital audio, sorry, it was a digital video, digital audio on an old school NES. So you pop it in your console, with no modifications, and it plays real video and it plays digital audio, like instrument recording and things of that sort, right? Uh, but because of it being so special, the, the board itself required, and this was engineered by a friend of mine in um, California, uh, that there's two chips that were missing, and because of the pandemic, completely like halted production, right? And so it's one of those where whatever it is you're making, I guess what I've learned is make sure it's available. Because if not, you're gonna run into this like production yeah. limbo, and you're gonna be stuck constantly like, you know, telling your backers, hey guys, so sorry. It's I, you know maybe a couple more months. I don't know how long it's going to take. You know it's and so you so that you don't run into that maybe write or, or or develop for a console where maybe you don't run into that kind of issue or what you're building doesn't require a special board. You know, but again sometimes I guess you just learn from mis mistakes and or from the process itself. So that actually brings me back to the cons of doing things like Kickstarter. Kickstarter is great to get the money for the things that you need, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you also have to fulfill what you promise. Mm -hmm. And like in your case, I don't know about you, but did you get like really angry emails from people? You know, surprisingly, everyone has been super sweet except for one person. No, lucky you. A little, yeah. <laughs> everyone's super understanding, which is, which is really nice. And, and I can't say everyone will be that lucky. Um, you know, but I think what's important is that you have open communication. You know, you're letting your backers know, hey, either catch it on social media, or you'll see a post here, or, or something. And in the meantime, I've actually even released the album that was supposed to be released with the cartridge. I've already pre-released it. It's been, it's had a soft release. All backers have it now, and so, so it's, so it's still moving. There's still movement. The project hasn't halted. It's just the production for that board is, is being held up. Uh, but you have to find ways to still keep your backers, um, Keep them happy, because at the end of the day, it's a product, it's a service, right? Yeah. That you are providing, um, and they're giving you money, and they're so. giving you money. So you got you got to make sure you, you, you give something in return. Um, I will say I have not been so lucky. Mm. I've oh. gotten some emails with very colorful language <laughs> oh, wow. about where their products are. <laughs> so, but it's it's that's another thing. That's a, that's definitely a con about doing 
crowdfunding is you're getting the money ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically a pre-order system, but on a larger scale with a lot more visibility. But at the same time, if you say, oh, this game is going to be released at this time. I told people that our game was going to be released in a year, and then the year came around and everyone was like, where's our game? You know, and it, it, it took like two years to finally get our game out. And uh, because we just ended up throwing so much at it that the game cycle just took longer than we thought it was going to take. But people will be upset over it. Oh, yeah. yeah. But again, it's, it's, as long as you have open communication, you're talking to your people, you know, there's, um, it should be okay. Yeah. All right. Well, our very last talking point before we show you guys a couple more trailers yeah. is post-launch, once we put the game out, right? Like, post-launch engagement. Uh, this is where you put out a game, you want to make sure that your game gets to as many hands as possible, mm -hmm. never turn down an interview, because that's another thing too, everyone's going to want to interview, and it doesn't really matter if they're the smallest channel or a super large channel, yep. I never turn down a, a single interview. Or... I mean, even if like the, the review, for example, if someone wants to review your game, I think what's, what I found to be helpful was getting people to review the game. You know, like, yeah, I'll send you a copy, you know, if you review the game. Uh, and so then that, therefore, now it's in front of an entirely different audience that I would not have been able to, to reach because now they wrote the review. And the review sometimes is good, sometimes it's, you know, it was all right, you know, it was, uh, maybe it lacked a little bit of this, but it's okay. At least there be, it's being talked about and it's now, you know, it's, it's in people's minds. Right. I was going to say, that's why uh, Steam keys and such are like such a good thing for certain games, you know? Uh, you know, Steam keys, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. Be ready to give those away. Yeah, so. for sure. Uh, soundtracks are super important too, is what I like to do as well. Like Ninja, for example. Um, it's not explicit, like when you buy the game off my site, but sometimes I'll send you the, the soundtrack just because, hey, why not? You know, a little extra for, for you know, you purchasing the game. Um, people really like that. Uh, yeah. Little surprises. Bundles. The good stickers and things of that yeah. sort that weren't necessarily explicit, but you're just adding a little extra. Uh, again, yeah, those cost money to make, but at the same time, it, it is that aspect of marketing and uh, just kind of getting people hyped uh, around your product. Yeah. You know? And it's really how you market it to, you know, to your audience. What You basically just want to ask them what it is they want. What do you want to see? What kind of bundles do you want? What do you want in your bundle? You know, because people almost always want soundtracks. Soundtrack CDs are always like the thing that people people want. I'm one of those people. Yeah. You know, I always wait for whatever bundle comes with a soundtrack before I buy it from anywhere. Mm -hmm. People absolutely love soundtracks. They love collectible stuff. Whenever I put out a game, mm -hmm. uh, the different versions that I have, I have bundles for every version. Where I will put out a bundle with the specific soundtrack for the chiptune version, the specific soundtrack for the Red Book audio version. And then I would, I'll, I'll do prints. I love doing things like prints. I'll do acrylics and I do different bundles. People love collectible stuff. So if you have the bandwidth to put out your game and pack it with a collectible, absolutely do so. Because people, people eat it up. They love it. And it's a good way to make a little extra income to do other things as well. Like you need to pay for anything, for marketing, for advertising, or yeah. what have you. Doing like even limited releases at, at times too, if you decide, because the game's already out, right? But then you're like, you know, I added something extra to the game. Maybe I changed some of the, the soundtrack, some yeah. of the music. Uh, I'm gonna release it now as just a 20 physical copy. You know, one of 20, you're gonna check it out. You know, just kind of put that out as a, like a, a boost for a game that's been out for a few years now, but now it's had a, something altered on it. So you can kind of resurface it again. You can do things of that sort too, to, to yeah. create more hype around it, so. Yeah. Right. So, do you think we can show them some, a couple trailers yeah. and then maybe do a little Q&A if anyone wants to ask yeah. us some questions? I think that's good. Okay, so the next trailer I'm going to show you guys is Sergio's game called Ninja 1 and 2. This is the trailer for the Nintendo Switch version of that game.
Sergio's game, which is Ninja 1 and 2. Can, can they get this now? Yeah, uh, the, I mean, the, the ROM and the game itself, like the physical NES copies are available. The game should be up soon, I want to say in the next month or two. We literally are getting it approved now by Nintendo. Oh, and it's that's going through. Yeah, it's going that through the checks the right now. And Nintendo <laughs> is really, really, really strict. Yeah. They're they super, the, super what strict. Is the, what is the process? That, uh, they have a name for it. They have a name. I green, forget the name. Green Lot? Or something dumb. Something like that. Yeah, it's <laughs> weird. Remember. And it's... you just can't use certain words, like start, yeah. select. You can't say certain things. Like it's very, very, very stringent. Yeah. But fortunately, the publisher I'm working with is Nami Tento. Again, this is another aspect too that through networking, I, I got to meet the the person who owns Nami Tento. Um, network, super important. Network. I just I forgot to mention that earlier. But yeah. Make sure you network. It's super, super important. Anyway, uh, he he does all the lot checks for PlayStation, lot check. Lot check. that's lot check. That's what it was. Not lot checks for uh, PlayStation, he does it for Nintendo, he does it for Xbox, and so this game will be on all those platforms as well, so. You can't say start Yeah, Nintendo, it's just, yeah, because oh, there was, right. there was weird. I don't, no. well, uh, because plus, plus and minus, yeah, for the Switch, so you have to just there you go. change the terminology. So it's got, to, it's got to match what it's on. It's still kind of dumb. Yeah. It's still kind of silly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't make the rules. Game, right, like, yeah. You, know. what it used to be. you just got to play yeah, by the rules, yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that was like real instrumentation, like the guitar, drums, everything. I, I layered it like cake. All by you? Yes. So the, the intro, even the intro, like the 8 bit that you heard, wrote that. Not actually in a tracker. The way I wrote music for that game was what started me getting into programming. Was completely written in like hex values. So for those of you that don't know hex, hex is just a form. It's a count-based system where it's you're using 16 digits: zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, A, B, C, D, E, F, and then it like starts changing. So anyway, the, I had to write music in that format, and so I had like this cheat sheet next to me where I'm like, okay. Uh, the rhythmic value of a quarter note matched it with this particular pitch. Okay, it's gonna go right here in the code. Okay, it was so meticulous. It was insane. Like, but that's just how the game was written, you know. And that's how like I got into it. But uh, uh, yeah, so it was the eight bit and the real instruments. Uh, do you have any resources you might be able to suggest for like getting into uh, composition for uh, game soundtracks, that kind of thing? I've always had kind of a rough time, like, you know, you know the process probably, like yes. holding up a doll and just kind of staring at it, like, oh, what do I do, right? Yeah, well, to be honest, uh, a good, I think a resource, well, not even a resource, I would say you got to just kind of get your hands dirty by listening to what you like, pay attention to harmonic structure, it is so key, like, do research on chord progressions. Uh, get those down first. Chord progressions are so crucial because they are going to be the, 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 founding, the foundation of, of your music. Get those chord progressions down. Then, once you've got those chord progressions in place, start paying attention to your melody. But the melody will also be... Uh, it'll have to make sense to what game you're writing for. You know, the speed at which you're writing at. How fast is it moving? How busy are the drums? Are there any drums? What are you writing for is the first question you need to be asking yourself. Then, once you're at that point, you can start to determine what kind of instruments do I want to use, you know. But nonetheless, listen to, pay attention to chord progressions, so crucial. And then find your melody that fits well with each chord point. You know, there's going to be some music theory. Just, there's a lot of really good YouTube videos on music theory and structure. Just get a basic foundation. Right from the heart, but also keep in mind, like, that harmonic structure, because that's going to make your music sound better. So it's a, it's a combination of both, writing from the heart and also like thinking about what you're actually doing. Yeah. So, yeah, hopefully that helps. Yeah, for sure. All right, and then we yeah. have one. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say Game Boy is a good community to get into, like your chip tune stuff. Yes. There's LSDJ, there's so many Yes. And then that'll get you in to like learning how to, you know, do the hexadecimal and stuff and you can take it to other platforms. Hands down, jump on forums. Ask ask other people too. Be like, what do you use? What 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 inspired you? Like, what 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 has led you to this thing? Again, everybody has different resources of how they got there. Um, go ahead. Um, I was just gonna ask what your experience is working with voice actors. 
Uh, say that again. Do you have any experience working with voice actors for your indie games? Voice acting? Um, a little bit, but it, it was, uh, so it was, it was John the Immortal Han Hancock. He did his own voicing. He did his own, but, uh, but <laughs> he, like, uh-oh, whoopsie, like, you know, little noises, like sounds and things of like that sort. Not really voice acting, but it was, uh, I did have to work with compressing it for the Super Nintendo because it was a, a sound bite that was going to be used within the game itself. And so it's finding that right level of compression where you don't lose too much, and when it's talking, it goes, <laughs> Like it sounds crackly because it's way too compressed. It's to, it's avoiding that and just getting it to sound just right. So, I mean, to an extent, you know, with voice acting in that regard. So with our game, uh, Epic Student Yuki, we do have voice acting in the Steam version, which is the newest version of the game that's coming out. In these legacy versions, there's no voice acting, but I basically source the voices with people that I know, like people who are like, oh, I've always wanted to try to do like voices for something and, and they offer, which is awesome. They're like, I'll just do it, I wanna do it. You know, I'm like, I, don't, I can't pay you. And they're like, I don't care, I, you know, I wanna do it. <laughs> so in my case, it was just, <laughs> no, right, yeah. And so it's like, all right. But uh, getting to know people who want to do stuff like that, it, it's great because then they offer their, their talents. It's a win-win situation. They get their voice out there. You know, I get a voice for my game. And uh, speaking of my game, if I can show you a uh, quick trailer of my first game, it's called Fiction Yuki. Yuki. All right, and at this point, we're going to open it up to questions for a couple minutes. Reggie. Yeah, when did it become available on the Switch? Uh, November 2nd of last year. Okay. We put it on the Switch digitally. Hopefully, we can work out a deal with some other third publisher to put, do a physical version, but right now, there's there's no plans as of yet. But we're hoping. I love Yeah. Oh, we'll talk. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but Reggie sounds like he's got some too. Yeah. yeah. Networking. Yeah. What's the process of putting uh, your game? What's the process of a person, a regular player, playing your turbo graphics game? Like as a console, right? So how yeah. do they actually get the file? Is it a CD? Oh, it's a CD. It's a physical CD. You send them out. Yeah, so we, we did, um, when we released the, the first one, we did a thousand copies of it. And uh, even though it's a super obscure console, like nobody knows, like, what the hell is a TurboGrafx CD, right? Because it's, it's, it's old. We did a thousand copies of it, and in like a year, I think we almost sold all of them. And then a channel called My Life in Gaming played it, and then we ended up getting a bajillion orders. And then Reggie, Radical Reggie, who's in the audience right now, uh, he is big time retro YouTuber also talked about it. And so we, had, we ended up having to do a second, a whole like second thousand batch because you know, people towards the end started talking about it. And so, uh, yeah, it, it worked out. But yes, it's a, it's a physical CD, but uh, I am gonna make the ROMs available. People keep asking, cause like people now have misters and like they wanna emulate it on their Steam Deck or whatever. And I, just because I haven't gotten around to it, but. 
I will be putting like the ROMs for people to buy at a much cheaper price than buying the physicals. And I think you you sold yours too, right? Like They're physical and digital. And digital, ROM. right? I do both. Yeah, two thousand units. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, we still have some, some from the media. second mm -hmm. round. But that's good. Yes. Cool. Uh, what was the hardest part of translating your comic into the game? Oh. Well, one of the things is not being able to like add everything I wanted to add because like my my the comic book like the story of the comic book. There's a lot of different things that I, I wanted to throw into the game that I couldn't because I wanted to keep the game linear and even so the game is not so linear. There's still a lot of story bits, but I wanted to like tell as much of the story of it as I can. But I think a big part of it is trying to keep everything together. This is actually my a copy of my web comic. Um, this is the only one I brought because I'm giving this to Happy Console Gamer because he's a huge PC Engine Turbo Graphics fan as well. But uh, I would say trying to fit everything, all your ideas into the game from from the comic was was hard for me. Without trying to like throw in everything and just bore people because people at the end, when it comes to playing a game that's story driven, they they just want to kill things. You know, right? Like you can't bore them with too much story; they're just gonna put it down. And Hopefully that answered your question. Yes? I was going to say, is there, to add on to what you were just saying, uh, some companies put in like a 40 second or a 75 second rule between events. Like, uh, I know Bethesda with some of their uh, games, like uh, Fallout 4, it's like 76 seconds or something like that. It's, it's for retention, you know? Mm, right. I, I'm just guessing it's probably like five, uh, five back and forth dialogues between each level, right? Yeah, so with our game, because it's an old game, we, we try to just put all of the dialogue bits just between yeah. between the stages and then boss events. Like, when they reach the boss, they'll talk to the boss for a little bit, and that's pretty much it. So we, we try to keep it as short as possible. And I thought I was keeping it short, but like some people were like, how do you skip this? So I'm like, oh, maybe the dialogue is a little too long. So this next game, there's like almost no dialogue. It's like the game has a story, and then it'll have an ending, but it's pretty much just straightforward action. All right. Well, I think. Uh, oh, ready. Well, I'm glad you asked because we are working on a Game Boy version of FX Unit Yuki called FX Unit Yuki Mini Mix, and although Mini Mix is going to be a, a scaled down version of FX Unit Yuki, it is a sequel to FX Unit Yuki. It does progress the story of FX Unit Yuki. For the Game Boy, and then eventually we will do a proper FX Unit Yuki 2. But it's basically just to tie people over until we get to FX Unit Yuki 2. So it will be regular Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Color? It'll be uh, Game Boy and Game Boy Color. Wow. Yeah, it'll be compatible with both. Physical? Physical. Yes. yes. Physical. All right. And I think our time is up. Hopefully, no one else is using this room yeah. after us. Yeah, we're like going over it's by really, minutes. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much for coming out. Appreciate thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, for free, 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 free,